have been victorious over cancer to accompany families. We give thanks for their willingness to share their time and their ability in this kind of capacity. Throughout this 2017, we have also been taking the fourth Sunday of the month and celebrating the 500th anniversary of the Reformation when the Word of God was brought to the forefront, when changes were brought to the church, uh, bringing and restoring the song to the church. Uh, and we give thanks to God for the one who was courageous to lead that effort, and that was Martin Luther. Today, we're, we're pausing to take some time and remember the gift of song. Because what Luther came to recognize, and I think it's a truth today that we grab a hold of, is that when words of scripture, when truths of scripture are put to song, they are much more memorable than spoken words. When the melody and the harmony and the instrumentation and the words all converge, they have a way of filling our soul with power. Luther said this when he once said that Christ enters the depth of the singing heart with incomparable power and rises out of it again. There's power in music. I'm thinking Tuesday morning when you hop into the shower, most of you might have a song that runs through your head. Some of you will sing, some of you will hum, some of you will moan, but few of you will remember quotes from this sermon. It's music that runs through the soul of our life. And that's where the power lies. Luther recognized this truth so much that what we still have today is about 40 of the hymns that he wrote as he tried to tell the story of Jesus and put it into word and into song. I will tell you that a lot of Luther's hymns, melodies, are not the easiest thing in the world to sing and they're not hitting the top of contemporary charts today. But there are a couple of songs that we will sing in this message that would require you to find a hymn book in your pew. I'll make reference to that in a little bit, but what I want to say at the outset was it's interesting that Luther, contrary to a, a famous theologian from last century by the name of Karl Barth, who thought that everything that Mozart wrote was the greatest thing since sliced cheese, thought that Mozart was the kind of music that the angels in heaven sang and played, and that the timpanis and the uh, trumpets would blare out Mozart's music. Well, I want to say that, that Luther was pretty clear about a couple of things. He thought the timpani and the trumpets uh, were heaven's battle cries, a terrible shouting in the honor of God. He couldn't stand those instruments. It drove him nuts. On top of it, he didn't like the pipes of the organ either. He found that they were a, table, were a terrible scream and shout in the face of God. Because you see, Luther, as is true of most of us, I think, love the instrument that we ourselves play and think it's the best. So for Luther, he thought the simplicity of the lute was the perfect instrument for singing. But he wrote music. He brought music back to the congregation. Up until that point, congregations would gather, the word would be spoken in the mass, but they would sit there kind of Blazed, glazed over because there was no music going on unless there was a procession on a festival out of doors. So Luther came to bring music back because he recognized that God gave us a voice. The Psalms, as we sang about the song today, the Psalms are filled with the song of God. Luther also did not write hymns that were about laments in anguish, in pain. He wrote hymns and music about the fact that God is a God of love and mercy and forgiveness, not guilt and shame. And that God has come to set us free to bring God's praise. He was referred by one songwriter in a nearby community as the Nightingale of Wittenberg because of how much he loved music. He played, he sang, he loved singing and singing well. His family sang and played together. He and the former nun Katie, his wife, did many musicals together with their family. He wrote a parish songbook. 
And it was to this that Luther also said, the most profound way we can teach the faith to children is to teach them the songs of faith, songs that tell the story of Jesus. So I say to you parents and to you grandparents, dig out, look for the songs that tell the story of Jesus for your kids and your grandkids. And when they're in your home, teach them these songs that we might impart scripture into their lives because unlike words that are spoken which are easily forgotten, when we start to sing songs and melodies that we like, those words are repeated over and over and over again. Luther was a Christmas boy because he found in the story of Christmas that this is God's story of infinite love. This is God in the flesh. This is God in our midst. This is God here right with us, breathing and struggling and working with life side by side, rubbing elbows with people. God is here in our midst of the incarnation. Jesus taking on human flesh, the story of Christmas, hit home with him in a profound way. So I'm going to ask you to turn to hymn number 268 which is a Christmas hymn that Luther wrote, the melody as well as the words to. And what's profound about this, we're gonna sing verses one, two, three, and then as you look down under page hymn 268, verses 12 and 13 follow right underneath it. All right, in the first three verses, it tells the story of, of Christ becoming one of us. And then in 12 and 13, Luther, who speaks to the heart, friends, listen, he speaks to the heart. He wants Christ to be born in the manger of our heart so that we might know that he's with us, that we might live in the power of his name. In these verses 12 and 13, it speaks about that very thing. So when we sing, although Luther wanted us to sing well, he ultimately wanted us to sing not just with the voice, but with the heart as well, to worship God with the heart. So let us sing together verses 1, 2, 3, 12, and 13 from heaven above. From heaven above to In those last couple verses, you could feel uh, Luther's heart 
and the desire to see that kind of cradling image happening within our lives. Because what he was looking for was changed lives, a changed congregation, and that they might experience Christ and then take the songs and be singing them as they would be going about their week. Luther also battled with some depression. He uh, battled against uh, evil, both in terms of himself and in terms of his experience in life. He went through some very lonely times in translating both the Old and New Testament from Hebrew and Greek. And during one of those times, feeling like Satan was attacking him, he took the ink, the ink well and threw it against the wall and said, Satan, get out of here. And so we'll also be singing uh, Luther's famous battle hymn which talks about this kind of evil that wants to steal and destroy life, that wants to separate us from God, but also separate us one from another. So we turn to hymn number 504. And this will be the last hymn that we sing. Number 504, uh, perhaps Luther's most famous of his hymns. We'll sing verses 1, 2, and 3. Believing that you sing best on your feet, let me ask you to stand as you're able. Let's sing boldly. seated. That one little word is certainly Christ Jesus, our Lord. That is the word that overcomes because it is Christ who is the victor and the victor indeed. Jesus says in John chapter 10, these words when he's talking about being the good shepherd, he said, the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But I have come that you may have life and have it abundantly. The thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy, but I've come that you may have life and have it abundantly. Our God is a God of life, amen? Amen. Certainly death happens. Sometimes death comes too early. And certainly on this Pink Heel Sunday, we also recognize that cancer comes to kill, steal, and destroy along with a lot of other things, diseases as well as people's behaviors that kill, steal, and destroy. But God is a God of life. So we stand against 
cancer. Because cancer wants uh, people to feel isolated, to feel weak, to feel forgotten. And one of the gifts that Pink Heels brings is teaching us about the importance of accompaniment, coming alongside people, both the family as well as the individual with the disease, with the illness, the person who is battling within. The cancer itself comes just simply to destroy cells within us, to steal life, and oftentimes to steal life early. And so cancer, together with other diseases, we can hate, but people we must love, and in people we must hope. Jody and I traveled on our getaway and and passed through Charlottesville, Virginia, and got out of our car like 20 minutes before the memorial service for Heather, who had been killed in the midst of all of that hatred. And coming out of the parking garage, I could sense inside of myself the smoldering remains of hatred, of all the actions and words and attitudes of hatred that had been spoken and acted out in that place. It reminded me of a time in my first parish when I got a phone call in the early hours of the morning from a woman in the church who was locked in her bathroom and I could hear the screaming in the background and she was afraid. And as I drove in and the the front door of the house was wide open, I could hear before I unlocked the doors of my car the hatred being spoken by the husband to the wife. And as I walked into the house and tried to interject some sanity in the midst of the hatred, I could hear the sheriff's cars rolling up behind me. It's that kind of hatred that paralyzes and isolates and speaks fear into our souls. But what we see in John 10 and what we see in a mighty fortress is our God, that Satan comes to kill, steal, and destroy, comes to fill us with hatred, comes to fill us with fear of people simply because they are in some way different than us. Whether that difference be that they're sitting in a wheelchair and we don't know how to interact, we feel awkward. It's not till we kneel down or sit down alongside and have a conversation or hold a hand. It's not until we go to that nursing home and hold the hand of the person who has lost their ability to communicate due to Alzheimer's that we discover that we experience the power of Christ in the other in the other human being. Oftentimes we think as the ones who are clearly the people sent out of the church into the world, that we're the ones who bear Christ to the world, and indeed we do. But Jesus says in Matthew 25 that when we clothe the one who is naked, when we feed the one who is hungry, when we visit the person in prison, and it doesn't say if they're guilty or innocent, when we visit the person in prison, When we care for the sick, we experience Christ in the other. That's the profound nature of the God who has made us, who puts his spirit of breath inside of all of us. And the profound experience we have when we stand up together against racism, simply based on color or language or sexual orientation, whatever divides us that causes us to somehow think we're better, we have lost our sense of the fact that we're creature and only God is creator, amen? You see, it's God who has made us and made all people and all of God's creation that God loves. And who are we? to somehow think that because of who we are or our education or our race or whatever, that somehow we're better than another. You see, we experience the power of Christ when we sit alongside and spend time with someone battling with mental illness. Whatever kind of disease may have struck them, a person of color, a person speaking another language, as we break these barriers, as we build bridges together, We experience Christ in the form of the other. This is what Luther was speaking about. Christ be born in my heart. God is calling us, friends, not to a place of fear. Fear is the work of the devil. Not to a place of hatred. Hatred is the work of the devil. But God calls us rather to stand up for what's right and just and true. To advocate for others. To dare to risk of ourselves. To 
to experience Christ in the other human being. It not only strengthens us, it's not only profound experience for ourselves, but it's what strengthens our community. It's when we accompany those who battle illness and their families that we find the hope that Christ needs to give to all of us. It helps us to deal with our own mortality and our own fear of death when we experience life together, sharing life one with another. Friends, I thank God for you. God has a work to do here at Grace and inside of Grace and in our community. God is at work in our midst. It's in these relationships. It's our relationships with our partner churches in Tanzania. It's our partnership relationship with Westside Church of God in Christ. It's our partnership relationship with GPS Faith Community. These relationships strengthen us. They help us because we become stronger together when we share life one with another. And thank God it adds some variety to our life. When people have a different opinion, a different experience, a different song in their heart, a different meal that they set before us, whatever it might be. This is the gift of the variety of the song that Luther spoke about. God has written all kinds of songs to bless our life as we bless God and as we share life together. So I close us today reminding us, reminding us, friends, that indeed it is Christ who comes to give life and abundance in life. Let us seize it. Let us look for it. And there's a prayer in this book that I often use at the close of funerals. And if you turn to page 87, I use this prayer attributed to St. Francis because I think it summarizes really the heart of what the gospel is about. Page 87, it's not about us. It's about when we encounter others, we experience Christ Jesus in its most profound way. The second prayer from the top, page 87, let's pray that with our heart and our voice together. Lord, make us instruments of your peace. Where there is hatred, let us so love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is discord, union. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. Grant that we may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive. It is in pardoning that we are pardoned. And it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. Friends, let us stand up to fear. Let us stand up to hatred. Let us stand up to injustice in this community where we live. And may God give us the courage to be blessed as we open our hearts and our lives to the other, that we might experience Christ in powerful ways through the gift of life that God has given to all God's people. Amen. We join in praying together as our Lord has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever.